I, I, want you to, I want you to stay standing just for a moment. I know that you're used to standing when you were in the military. You, you ran to get to a place to stand. Isn't that right, Kenny? You ran to stand, and then you ran to stand again. Right, Ben? But it taught you discipline. You know, a lot of us, uh, that today's message has a lot to do with defending boundaries. Uh, one of the things our nation has not learned yet, but the nation of Israel has. And I, I want to defend the nation of Israel today. I'm going to walk you through some things and help you understand, particularly this generation, why they're doing what they're doing and, uh, and trying to walk through some stuff. But here at the Little Country Church, we honor you. We thank God for you. Frank, we know that you, your brother, your twin brother went to Vietnam after you and he didn't return. And, uh, you know, and you were here to carry on his legacy. And a lot of you lost friends in the military. Our freedom is always unfinished business. You stepped up. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. You gave up. You gave up your time. You gave up your careers. And many of you gave up friends that were there. You picked up your weapon. It's, it's bloody. It's not easy to decide that you're going to have to take someone's life to defend this nation. You stood up for our freedom, and we want to thank you for that. And you didn't draw back. You stayed at it. Isaiah says in chapter 6, verse 8, Isaiah said, I heard a voice saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then said, I hear am I send me. You went, and it cost you. It cost you. We salute you this Veterans Day weekend. I know yesterday was Veterans Day, but this is the weekend of it, and uh, I don't want this house to forget it, or those who are watching me online today. So we salute you. We thank God for you. Romans 13 says, give honor where honor is due, and it's due you. And I'd say, God bless America. Y'all give these guys another hand. <laughs> Amen. Just want you to know we love you guys. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated. My dad was a veteran. My uncle a veteran. My cousins were veterans. My grandpa was a uh, paratrooper in World War II, jumping out of airplanes. He limped because of the, what he endured there. And uh, when I ask my dad, he will not talk about it. All he tells me is he peeled potatoes. And uh, so whatever y'all get to do getting paid for peeling potatoes, I think that was another way of saying he stayed in trouble. And to know my dad, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Military has some expectations to it. While talking to a potential recruit, the military recruiter said, exactly what kind of job are you looking for in the military? The high school kid said, well, I'm looking for something with an enlistment bonus of about $20,000 where I won't have to work too hard and won't have to deploy overseas. The recruiter said, well, what if I could hook you up with a skill that would allow you to become straight in as a captain where you'll only work weekend, weekdays and you can have the base of your choice and stay there as long as you want? The young recruit sat up straight and said, wow, are you kidding? And the recruiter replied, yeah, but you started it. Amen, it's not that way. When Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner over 200 years ago, he called America the land of the free, the home of the brave. Those words are as true today as they were then. And throughout this nation's history, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen have bravely answered the call to defend our freedom, to aid our friends and allies, and to turn back aggressors. Today, I stand looking at our nation and ask myself, God, if our boundaries were to be encroached, would we as a nation stand against it? Because what has happened, you know, our nation honors her sons and daughters. That's what we do. We honor them. But liberty is purchased. It's a purchased commodity. We say freedom is free. It's not free. It costs. Mankind is often ruled over by power-hungry rulers who hold their citizens in captivity within their own land. Just listen. Governments can rule over people and strip them of their individual freedoms. That's why I thank God for our guns. 
that we are a nation that can carry it. I read a story this morning before I came about a man in Los Angeles that took a gun and defended his family and ran off two would-be robbers who were shooting back at him as he shot at them, and he rebuked the liberal city of Los Angeles for not allowing citizens to have their own guns while the, while the I want to say the enemy, while thieves and robbers have guns. We have to be able to defend ourselves. Amen. Amen. So this nation we live in is free only because others saw the tyranny of England and taking their money and taxes to support the English system. Our forefathers came to this land to be free to worship God according to the dictates of their own hearts as they saw fit instead of a government which would tell them how and where they could worship. The founders of our Constitution believed in the true principles of liberty and freedom which they believed were God-given rights to all men, not just to some. And hear me, our freedom to worship was, has never been under a microscope as much as it was in 2020 when we were told during a pandemic, pandemic we couldn't gather to worship. And because of that, many folk backed away from church, and, and some have never returned even to this house because the government told them to stay home. And I say we have the freedom to worship. Freedom was purchased from England by taking a stand for fighting for it. This was a revolutionary, the revolutionary, and listen to the, even the name, it was a revolution. The Revolutionary War caused a revolution in this nation. The stand they took was taken by fighting for what they believed, and that fighting cost people their lives. The Veterans Day started during this time. What a cost of this war. Amen. It cost many lost their homes. Many older folk lost their children. Truly, freedom isn't free. Someone has to pay the price of liberty and if our liberty were threatened again if our liberty see we go and protect other people's liberty but if our liberty like it was during the revolutionary war were protect, were threatened again and sometimes i believe it's already happening would we be as willing as our forefathers to take a stand against those who try to remove those freedoms even to the point of fighting i want to defend the nation of israel today when I look at their flag, I saw the Star of David. When you see the Star of David, you got to realize that these people understand the Old Testament and the understanding of King David and how David fought and why he fought. Psalm 144.1 says, Praise be to the Lord my God who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. Here was a musician. Here was a worshiper. Here was a man after God's own heart that said and announced that, praise God, that he trained my hands to fight. He trained my fingers. Amen. He set me into a place as a kid to sling a stone, to throw a spear. I knew how to use a sword. God trained my hands to fight. And because of that, when Goliath came toward the, uh, the Israelites, David saw it as a boundary uh, trespass. Amen. It wasn't the fact that, that Goliath was yelling. You got to understand there was a boundary there. And what's taking place now is a group of people crossed the boundary, went in and killed 1,400 uh, uh, Jewish people, massacred, beheaded, raped, and burned them. And because of that, we sit back over here, and a lot of our nation is acting in some way like, hey, you ought to just leave. And now, look, you go kill 1,400 of them and leave them alone. No, that ain't the way they think. Them, their actions are about, listen, you attacked us, you crossed our boundaries, now it's over. We're going to fight. And we're going to keep fighting. It's going to happen. This is not something that just happened today. They look back into history. It's inbred inside of the Jewish people. And if we don't fight, we can lose five, six million of us. We had a Holocaust in 9-11. Uh, what was that, Kenny? Almost 3,000 people died. Boy, we went to war over it. They've had millions get slaughtered while the world sat back and did nothing. So they said, enough's enough. We're not listening to the White House or any of y'all's church houses. Or any of y'all's little Starbucks houses. Amen. We're going back in to fight. So it's going to take a price. Everybody say a price. The first price is the price of allegiance. We stood and we pledged allegiance to the flag. The word allegiance simply means to stand for something. That's why when people kneeled during the allegiance, it bothered many of us. It affected us because the word allegiance means to stand for something. And one of the things we stand for is a nation for freedom and a willing to fight to keep that freedom. 
So allegiance was very important. David fought for his sheep. He had an allegiance to his family. He said, you ain't taking my sheep. Amen. You ain't going to do that. They represented food. They represented covering. They represented drink. They represented income. Amen. So he fought for his sheep. The scripture says in 1 Samuel 17, 28, when, and I'll get to the other scriptures in a minute, but when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the, with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those? few sheep in the desert. You may call them a few sheep, but to me, they're everything. So David, you know the story. He took the wine and the bread and he brought it to his brothers who were on the front line of battle for 40 days. They faced the Philistines. And, they, and I'm not here to be humorous about this story because I can be. You know that. But here they, they came to a place, a boundary line. And at that line for 40 days, Goliath, he began to defile the armies of God. He began to curse. He began to yell about your God, Jehovah. And David got there and he heard it. And when he heard it, Something jumped down in his spirit, and he said, that ain't right. You can't stand here and let that man defile our God, cross our line. Amen. 1 Samuel 17, 34, but David said to Saul, that's the king, your servant's been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. When's the last time you ran at something that could eat you? I ran after it. Amen. I went after the bear. Amen. I went after that thing. I went after the, the lion that carried off the sheep from the flock. I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. I didn't give it time to eat it. I didn't give it time to kill it. When it returned to me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Now listen to the graphics here. He ran after the bear or the lion that had the sheep, rescued it from its mouth, takes the sheep back, and then the animal came after David. And David said, I grabbed it by the hair of his chin and chin chin. And I pulled that son of a gun down and I slew it. See, the issue here was, what makes you think you can kill Goliath? Well, let me tell you why I know I can do this thing. Because I've been depressed before and I came out of it. Because I've lost loved ones before and I kept serving God. Because I've lost all my money before in bankruptcy, but I came back. Amen. The reason why I can win today is because I've had past victories. See, your past victories mean everything to you. When you've won battles in life, when you've, when you've overcame in life or overcame cancer or whatever it is you overcame in life and you bounced back. You, you went through a divorce and it didn't take you out. You bounced back. Amen. When you went through something in life and you bounced back from it, then you're able to say, listen, I've been through something back there and because I've been through so I took care of a lion I took care of a sheep you see this necklace it's got it's got bear teeth on it amen and lion paw amen I slew it and I kept some of it I told Josiah after he killed that deer that Don Nash had made me a I'd killed a deer and he made me a necklace out of the deer teeth yeah Yeah, that right. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, this uncircumcised Philistine. Boy, now David talking tough. <laughs> we'll be like one of them because he's defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. You see, I, I know that the reason I whooped that lion and that bear is because God was with me. I know a lot of other people died from lions and bears. I know other people never came back from bankruptcy. I know a lot of other people didn't come back from the death of a spouse or a loved one. I know other people didn't come back from sickness. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. God strengthened me, and I came back from it. Amen. I've, I've, I've bounced back from where I was. So David fought for his shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I fought for him. Verse 45 says, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. See, I haven't forgotten whom you have, you've defiled, you defiled, amen, God, so I come against you in this way. So first is allegiance. I stand for some, I stand for the boundaries. This is the way they think. The second thing is the price of blood. You know Pearl Harbor alone, 2,400 people died in two hours? In two hours. It's the price of blood. 
It brought us into the war. Matter of fact, we probably would have never entered that war had not Japan attacked us in Pearl Harbor. But now, now we got to rise up. And I wonder what it's going to take for us to defend our boundaries today. There is much blood shed to secure nation, national boundaries. And make no mistake, David's confrontation with Goliath was because he crossed the line. And sometimes you got to look at the enemy and say, now look, you just crossed the line. You mess with my kids. You, you know, you mess with me all you want, devil, but you mess with my kids. Now you mess it. Now you just cross the line. After watching his Confederate soldiers cut to pieces, Robert E. Lee of the Confederate said, it is well that war is so horrible, else we would grow too fond of it. It's horrible to see the explosion and to see the guts and see the legs amputated. It's horrible. It's blood. But make no mistake, A, it's a line, allegiance. B, it's bloody. Amen. Real war is bloody. C is the price of courage. Everybody say courage. Oh, it's a powerful word. Regardless of the obstacle, the lion, the bear, amen, the Goliath, the marksmanship of the shepherd is not determined by how well he could hit a stationary target with a sling. Anybody could hit something with a sling that wasn't moving. The issue was learning how to hit an enemy while on the run forward. Listen, 1 Samuel 17, 48 says, The Philistine moved closer to attack David, and David ran quickly what? Say it again. Mm -hmm. Amen. Man, I love a church that can read. Ran toward the battle line to meet him. The battle what? There was a line. There was a boundary. And that, that, that lion, I mean, that Goliath def defied it and crossed it over and over again. See, it was more than just words. It was a boundary. Amen. Once he crossed the line, David ran to meet him as quick as he could, reaching into his back, taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Now, you've got to see it in your mind. This Goliath, I, I'm amazed at anybody that's 6'2", 6'4". One of my favorite series is fixing to come back on. I don't mind telling you. It's a dude named Reacher. This Reacher dude is 6'4". He's a monster of a guy. Man, I love this. It's coming back on. I'm excited. It's pretty clean, too, by the way. Uh, and, and, and when I see so, but to imagine somebody 10 foot tall, that, that's higher than that peak right there. And imagine David. He's 15, 16-year-old boy. But yet, he's got a God that is so big. Amen. See, a lot of people see problems that are big. David saw the problem next to his God, and it looked small. Amen. So when Goliath came out and he defiled David, he cursed David. He laughed at David. As a matter of fact, Goliath had an armor bearer that was probably taller than David that stood in front of him. He had, ar they, he had armor. The Bible talks about the armor that Goliath had. He, he was covered everywhere but his forehead. And to hit something moving is skillful. See, some people think it was God that did that. Uh-uh. He's skillful. He's good at what he's doing. I shot a coyote on the run once with witnesses. Rode that thing. Can I be honest with you? <laughs> I could never do that again. <laughs> that was just a really fortunate shot. But to take a stone and to whip it up beside his head, and to see that moment of courage, to run towards something that can devour you. I took out a lion, and I took out a bear. Goliath, you don't know that yet, but Saul knows it, and I'm going to fight in the name of the Lord. Amen. Courage. It's going to take courage. That's why when I hear the armies, did you know both armies in Gaza and Israel are calling on the name of their gods? In Israel, they're yelling Jehovah. In Gaza, they're yelling Allah. And here in our nation, because we're such a melting pot, we got the same thing going on. But everybody, somebody needs to be yelling Jesus. Amen. I said somebody needs to be yelling Jesus. Amen. Courage, the ability to face difficulty of, or danger with firmness. One man with courage is a majority. What separates courage from normality? Yeah, amen. Courage is determination, not education. You can't go get ed educated and get courage. Matter of fact, more education you get, probably more buck, 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 scared you get. Amen. You don't need that. You need courage to deal with. It. And then determination. A, B. A, allegiance. B, blood. C, courage. D, determination. Determination to finish. Our soldiers were determined to finish freedom for us, and they did. Thank God. Amen. We may speak English, but we don't 
drive on the wrong side of the road. We don't eat little cucumber sandwiches. We don't drink hot tea all the time and talk real funny. Hello. Though I love listening to them, I don't want to always talk like them. I can't imagine preaching like it. And David Ron and stood over him. See, that don't even, that don't even sound courageous. <laughs> David ran, stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine sword and drew it from the sky. I don't want you to hear this. There was a scene. There were some words back and forth, back and forth. David had a sling. He had five stones in his pouch, smooth stones, because only a smooth stone will fly straight. It's another sermon I could preach. Y'all know that Goliath had four brothers. Shama, Eliab, a uh, guy that had six fingers and six toes, Mr. 24 Phalanges. Didn't give him a name. I just named him that. Uh, he had some giants, and David had to deal with them later on. His men did. But we, we, that's another sermon. But David ran, reached in that pouch, and he pulled out that stone. He slipped it in that sling, and he slung it. David didn't have a sword. <laughs> didn't have a sword. And yet, he had the audacity by faith to look at Goliath when Goliath said, I'm going to feed you to the birds and the fowl of the air. And David said, I'm going to take your head from your shoulders. <laughs> you going to what? I'm going to take your head from your shoulders. Boy, you ain't even got a sword. I know. But in just a minute, one's going to come available. <laughs> and it's going to be yours. And David ran and popped him upside the head. Gave him something Excedrin couldn't take away. That big guy hit the ground. Now, again, I'm trying not to be as funny as I can be. But when he hit the ground, my question has always been, what happened to the armor bearer? The one that had the armor that stood in front of Goliath. See, I believe that when Goliath hit the ground, he squirted him. <laughs> yeah, that's an English word, squirted him. Squashed him right into the ground. Easy, amen. Just shoved him just poof, right there. If you hang out with the wrong peer pressure, one day it's going to squash you. Amen. It's going to come back on you. Be careful. You tell me who you hang out with, I tell you who you are. So beware. That's why I love all these shirts. That's a good hangout bunch here. So David ran, stood over him. He took out the Philistine sword, drew it from the scabbard, and after he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. Now, after he killed him, tells me that the hit here may have just knocked him out. Josiah may have had to give him a double tap. That's right. You know what I'm saying? He may have had to take him out again when he took out the sword. But I promise you this, when he removed his head from his shoulders, he was dead. If he wasn't, he died then. They turned and ran. What they turn and run from? Because when David took off that head, he held it up. Everybody saw it. It was all over ESPN. <laughs> they ran. Now, here's the problem. When you become victorious, JoJo, when you become victorious, if you're not careful, you get arrogant. Success is a horrible thing. All success, you're such a thief. Pastor Joseph, that's what my pastor told me this morning. He said, success is such a thief. Because I told him that last week when we were out golfing, that you chipped in a birdie from about 30 yards out, 40, 50, somewhere in there. Oh, it was a major moment. <laughs> you were so excited. I hated you. <laughs> but the next nine, the next nine, I caught you. Oh, I dropped a birdie. I got four pars. And then I looked at the score. Success, you're such a thief. Triple bogey. Boom. I went boom, straight down here. Couldn't hit a cotton picking thing. Amen. Such a thing. And here's the thing. David took out Goliath. Then David took out 200 Philistines. Then David married the king's daughter. He's already successful. He's up there. Then Saul's dead. Jonathan, his best friend's dead. I'm moving way ahead in the story. Now David, as a leader, he gets to a place of E. E is evoking God. To think to yourself that you killed a lion without God. You killed a bear 
bear without God. You took out Goliath without God. You can take. Listen, if our nation ever goes to fight again, we've got to call on the name of Jesus. Amen. We got to have his support. We got to have God's help here. This is what the Israelis are doing right now. Listen to me. David's big mistake was he numbered his fighting men. He got bored. He got bored. And he decided, you know what? I'm going to count how many men that I got to fight. You remember there was a time David went and hid in a cave when Saul was after him. 400 men who were discouraged, in debt, and discontent came and found him. He turned them into his mighty men. They were great men. These men would fight for him. Amen. But they all did it in the name of the Lord. Then David sat back on his laurels just a little bit. And he decided, you know what? I think I'm a pretty good guy. I think I can do all this on my own. So he began to count. And as he counted, 1 Chronicles 21, 12. Three years of famine. This is what God said to him. Because you counted your men, because now you think you got a million fighting men and I didn't fight for you, God could send one angel and take out thousands and had done it. God could open up the ground and have Korah and his bunch who, do, who came against Moses and swallow them. God could send snakes and bite them. Amen. And take out 17,000. He can do whatever he wants. And so uh, he was upset with David. See, David never had any miracles. Study the life of David. King David never had any miracles in his life. Elijah did. Elisha did. Moses did. Amen. But David never had a miracle in his life, per se. But he always had the hand of God with him. See, some of you say, I've never had a miracle in my life. Yeah, but you've had God on your side. Amen. He's walked with you. He's financed you. He's blessed you. He's favored you. He's given you the best friends you could ever have. Amen. He's looked after you. Amen. You ought to give God a praise for all the things he's done for you. So God gives a set of choices for David. Because he had counted his fighting men, and he had over a million fighting men, Amen. You can look at 1 Chronicles 21 and realize that he recorded his warrior strength, but he put a misplaced trust. Don't put your trust in your 401k. Don't put your trust in your Harley. Don't put your trust in people. Your trust belongs in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and all your ways. Acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. Proverbs chapter 3. Your trust belongs in him. How do you think you're going to get to heaven? Trust. I trust him. I believe in him. So the word was you got a choice. You can have three years of famine. Whew. Three years. You remember last week? Go ahead, did you? You remember last week? The siege around Samaria had only lasted for a, full, a few months. And they were eating donkey's heads for $350. They were eating dove dung for $20 for a drop of dove dung. That was a four-month siege around that city. They were turning to cannibalism and eating one another's children. David did not want to see three years of famine. I can't have that. And then, and then he goes on to say, uh, three months of being swept away before your enemies. I'm going to let your enemies come in and steal your children. Take away your wives. Take away eh, all the profits you made in life. Three months. Can you imagine in just one day what the, uh, the uh, Hamas did to Israel? In just one day. They, they disrupted that whole nation with 1,400. I'm going to give three months for the enemy to come in, sweep you, and begin to destroy you. Or I'll give you three days of the sword of the Lord. I'm going to send angels. Days of plague in the land with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of his. An angel. See, we forget about angels. Angels will come in and start ravaging. Now then, decide how I should answer the one who sent me. And David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into human hands. If God wants to take me, if God wants to kill me, if God wants to do anything he wants, that's fine. I can handle that. That's what Job did. I can handle that. But don't let me fall into human hands. For his mercy is great. 
So the Lord sent a plague on Israel. And 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. 70,000 fathers and brothers fell dead. Verse 17. David said to God, Was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I'm the one who was sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? O oh Lord God, let your hand fall upon me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. When I read this, I realized the humility of David at the moment when he realized the fact is this. I'm the one at fault. We have leaders that think you're the problem. They don't realize they're the problem. Our leaders have got to get to a place in life where they recognize, listen, unless I call on the name of the Lord, this thing ain't going to turn around. You know, and I know some people that wish this is preaching. No, this ain't just preaching. This is life. This, this is necessity. Amen. Our nation will fall into trouble unless somebody rises up in leadership and says, listen, God, I need your help. See, no matter the size of our military, our confidence should remain in God we trust. We're in a very unsure economic times. There's wars everywhere. It demands us to stay focused on, on, only, uh, on the only certain and uncertain world, and that's God himself. It's God himself. Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. David wrote this. Some in horses. But we're going to trust in the name of the Lord our God. Hold that there. Some trust in big bombs. Some trust in printing money. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. If everything taken away, I trust you, God. God is trustworthy. God is entrusted, placed within our care. Why do I tithe? Because I trust God. Why do I give? Because I trust God. Why am I in the house of God? Because I trust God. Why do I love you? Because I trust God. Why do I do funerals? Why do funerals? If, if you don't believe that person is going to heaven, why do funerals? Because I trust God. Amen. I trust Him. I trust Him with my possessions, and so should you. Our opportunities, our talents, and time that we now experience, and we are trustees of everything God has given us. We own nothing. We own nothing. I don't get to keep it. We get to enjoy it while we're here. But our greatest enjoyment is one another. Amen. So I close. The prize of allegiance. A, B, C, D, E. Blood, courage, determination. Don't evoke God. Often when I do funerals, memorials, for one of our saints, I'm reminded, I'm standing over one of the soldiers who fought a good fight. Paul said it, fight the good fight of faith. Fight with faith. Believe God for the best. Learn how to handle the verdict, but believe God. They're soldiers. We're all soldiers in the army of God. If you forget that soldier, then you just... Sometimes I want to preach on A-W-O-L. Folk that went AWOL. Church folk gone AWOL. Absent without leave. You left the youth ministry. You left the children's ministry. You left church. And you didn't tell me you was leaving. You AWOL. When I was a teenager, some of my friends went in the Marine Corps. They couldn't handle high school. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Kenny? They were failing, so they went in the Marine Corps. Well, that's smart. They came back visited with me because my house was the visiting place brought one of their buddies then when they went back to Japan Johnny and Rex when they went back to Japan their buddies stayed at my house we had a lot of fun but the question was why are you at my house when they went back to Marines I ain't going back well he got shot in the buttocks this true story this ain't Forrest Gump. He got shot in the back end and got a dishonorable discharge when the military police found him. Uh, I don't, I've never went out and shot anybody left this church. But I've thought about it. Shortly after joining the Navy, a new recruit asked his officer for a pass so he could attend a wedding. 
The officer gave him the pass, but informed the young man he would have to be back by 7 p.m. Sunday. The young man said, you don't understand, said the recruit. I'm in the wedding. And the officer said, no, you don't understand. You're in the Navy. We're in this together. Amen. We chose Jesus. We not only joined the church, we also joined the service of Christ. And that requires our attention. Father, I love you. I thank you for this house. I thank you for guests that enter this house. I thank you for our veterans today. I ask God that the memories that they've had of war and service, God, would not hinder their walk with God, but enrich it. Remind us, God, of our allegiance, not only to this nation, but our allegiance to serving you. You are our God and our commander. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Is that all right? Everybody good with that? All right. In the back, you got to see Mike. If you want uh, some barbecue, we'll bring it next week. Uh, there's shirts in the back also. I, love, I do love the shirts. I don't care if they don't look, if, they, if you say, I don't know if that's what Jesus looked like. That's what he looks like in my office. That's Jesus laughing. I always see Jesus laughing. Amen. Some of the stuff we do, you know he's laughing at us. Amen. I, I walked into that deer stand. Listen, when this young man got that deer on Friday, I was in that same deer stand on Saturday morning. I thought to myself, perhaps the other one will come out. And when I got in there, I realized, Tommy, that the windows were still open in the deer stand and that the a cover for his scope was still in the deer stand and all the stuff that he had the night before was still in the deer stand. And it hit me. This young man was so excited, he left everything and followed Jesus. <laughs> Give it up for your pastor this morning. <laughs> Excited about what God is doing over the next couple of months. Again, November 12th, Little Country Food Pantry. Uh, today is the last day to donate food for it for Thanksgiving. Um, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, we can do offering, too. That's pretty important. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll get to you in a second. We got to do the offering first. We'll get back to Miss Debbie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Said we, we get to prove our allegiance this morning in Jesus' name. Uh, today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates in return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Again, this isn't something we just say. We actually believe that. That's why it's up there. That's why we say it every single week. Sometimes you can get it in the